Americans, I have a message to all of you. Whether you're on the right, whether you support Trump, whether you're on the left, whether you hate Trump, does not matter. This is a message to you. You are under attack. The enemy knows that he cannot defeat you unless he manages to divide you first and weaken you. So you have to identify and understand the nature of this threat. And that's what I'm going to talk about here. When Castro took power on Cuba, the Soviet Union was still in existence. Castro mounted a strategy to weaken the United States using drugs. This was back in the days when the CIA was doing similar things. And remember, the Brits tried to weaken China in the 1800s in the Opium War using opium which is grown here, Afghanistan, as you so well know now. But over here, the drug in question is cocaine, which is grown down here and smuggled up. So Castro made a deal with the drug cartels that the ships could stop in and reload in Havana. And a lot of drugs went into the US that way. He took a little provision for it. I mean, if he was in it for ideological reasons, why charge, right? Well, he actually wanted the money. So Fidel Castro was a drug lord. And uh, the beauty of this weapon, he weaponized narcotics. And the beauty is that the victims pay for the war. Those of you who use cocaine are the ones who are paying the enemy. And moreover, you are the ones who are paying for the crimes against humanity that are being perpetrated as part of this drug war in Venezuela right now. There are systematic tortures going on in Venezuela. Me, just me, I have six friends who are sitting in prison in Venezuela being tortured and this is paid for by the cocaine users in the United States most of all. So, to continue the story, this is how he, he cooperated with Pablo Escobar, for, for instance. And uh, then when Chavez came to power in Venezuela, Chavez was held to power by Fidel Castro because he wanted to get it, to have a, the world's largest oil reserves. Castro wanted that since ever since he took power in Cuba. He wanted Venezuela as the bridgehead to Latin America. He tried to conquer Venezuela with a little military invasion. That failed. He supported the guerrilla. He supported FARC, the guerrilla here, ELN. He supported the guerrilla in El Salvador. All of his actions to support the guerrillas here in this region, it wasn't because he wanted some liberty for the Latin American people. It was because he wanted access to the drug routes, to the narco traffic, because there's so much money in narco traffic, and that's what he wanted. Castros are rich, extremely rich. They have got private islands. So anyway, back to the, to the matter of Chavez. When Chavez came here, Castro let him in on the little deal. And Chavez made a deal with the FARC guerrilla, which had been fighting for decades against the government in, in Colombia. And Fa he allowed FARC to make bases. They still have bases inside Venezuela. The leaders of FARC are living in the main military base in Venezuela. They're going on vacation to Cuba. So they are, they are very close together. All of this, Cuba, Venezuela, and the drug lords are like this. And now the president of Colombia has made peace with FARC, so they will come into the government here. Um, they are trafficking these drugs up this route here and also this road. We can see on maps, based on interviews with people and based on surveillance of aircraft and ships, we can see how the traffic is going. Let me use the blue color for the ship routes. It's going up here. And if we look at the air traffic, we can use red for that. The main route of air traffic, it goes in from the cultivation areas in Bogota, in Colombia, I mean, over the border to Venezuela. Actually, they fly from right on the Colombian side of the border. At 2 a.m., the, the military radar located outside Merida turns off. 2 a.m., it turns off, and the plane takes off here, 
And once it's out on international water, they turn the radar on again at 3 a.m. And then the, most of the flights turn west and they land in Olancho in Honduras. And then it's transported by pickups this way. Some of them land in, in, um, near the coast here and transported by lancha, small boats, up along the island chain into Yucatan. Now, a few years ago, the Mexico made, uh, passed some strict laws to try to give the impression that they were stopping this. And a lot of the Mexican drug lords were driven down to Western Honduras. So in Western Honduras, the Mexican cartel and the Colombian cartel meet and they fight for the territory. And that's why Honduras now has the highest murder frequency in the world. As you see, this traffic goes around Nicaragua because the president of Nicaragua, the old leftist Daniel Ortega, he's also a drug trafficker, of course, but he has control over his territory. So the traffic that goes through there goes in small boats along the coast of Panama and uh, Costa Rica, comes up into Nicaragua, and then it takes the Pan American Highway and just passes through Honduras into El Salvador, where the government is also an old leftist guerrilla, FMLN which, of course, also are in on the drug trafficking scheme with Castro. And this, here there are no elevated murder rates because this traffic, there is no contested zone. It just passes through Honduras. The president of Honduras is, of course, in on this. The previous president in Honduras, Porfirio Lobo, who is from Olancho, by the way, his son is serving life in prison in the United States for drug trafficking. His predecessor, who was a neighbor of him, also from Olancho, has not been convicted, but there are ample of, of uh, circumstantial evidence and, and the hearsay and stories about him being involved in the drug trafficking, and he was a friend of Chavez. So it's just it's, it's plainly obvious he was in on it. The present president, Juan Orlando Hernandez, has a brother who is under prosecution for drug trafficking in the U.S., and he's now going to be re-elected in violation of the Constitution. Remember when they threw out Celaya in 2009, June 28th? I guess you don't remember. The whole world said it was, it was a military coup. And the reason they threw him out was because he wanted to get re-elected against the Constitution. But the, the investigative office of the Library of Congress in Washington twice looked at this and determined that they had acted to defend the Constitution and they had acted in agreement with the Constitution. But now, Juan Orlando is doing the same thing. So if it was illegal and unconstitutional in 2009, how can it be legal now? Of course it's not. So this is another case of a president who is in on the drug trafficking and is holding on to power with unconstitutional means. The same thing that Chavez did in Venezuela, that Correa did in Ecuador, but he only did it for once and now he's out. Because the, the, this is the whole strategy. All of this comes from something called Foro de Sao Paulo, Forum of Sao Paulo. All the leftist parties here, led by Fidel Castro, gathered in Sao Paulo to make a strategy for keeping the United States out of Latin America. Brazil wants to be the regional superpower here. So they met in Brazil and they made this strategy, but in reality, Foro de Sao Paulo was the network of drug trafficking. However, that doesn't mean that drug trafficking is limited to leftist governments. By no way. The president of Honduras now Juan Orlando is from the right, from the conservative. The one thing that unites all of these regimes who are involved in drug trafficking is the money from the drug trafficking. If you have a presidential republic, which all of these are, you need a lot of money to be elected president. And where does that money come from? Those who have most money in this region are the drug cartels. The drug cartels can put up much more money on the table for a presidential candidate than civil society can. For instance, 
when Mel Zelaya was elected in Honduras two presidents back, he got $50 million from Colombia, way more than he could get from Honduras. So the system with the presidential republic, where you have one person as the head, who is elected with a lot of money, is a system that opens the arms for corrupt criminal money to flow into politics and to take power in the countries. The reason this hasn't happened in the US before is because there is so much money in the United States compared to the rest of the world. But now, when there is here in Moscow, the head of international crime is the richest man in the world, they say, Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin. He has the money to put up to buy the presidency of the United States. And he did it. Not by giving money to the campaign, but by using money to influence, not just the campaign, but influence the whole public debate in this country in such a way that he brainwashed the Americans basically into voting for Donald Trump. Not a majority, a minority, but still. What is happening here in the United States with the election of Trump is an effect of international organized crime waging a war against this country the same way they've been doing here for decades. It's not new, it's just that it has finally, or I don't like that word, but it has come to the United States. Americans, you are under attack. This is an act of war, a, a dirty war, using cocaine and drugs as weapons, using manipulation, brainwashing as weapons against you. The internet has been turned into a weapon. Remember 9-11? Remember the conspiracy theories about 9-11 that came before the official report was out? Who do you think was behind those conspiracy theories? Do you think some guy sitting on his bed was inventing those? No way. The conspiracy theories about 9-11 were concocted by Putin's people in Russia. And then he sent out his agents to other countries to talk to people, to influence people, to recruit them into uh, echo chambers into unknowing accomplices who wrote about these theories on internet and that's how he got them spread the conspiracy theories about 9-11 the lies about Hillary Clinton and others they are concocted by Putin's regime in Russia and they are tools of war in order to divide your country and take power in Washington. You better wake up because you are in five minutes before midnight to losing democracy and you losing your country.